most part of New Zealand is just saying we'd like a bit more information about the tax status as a proxy for the people who are buying homes in New Zealand and we agree with that but we don't want to do it in such a way that it's so cumbersome or expensive that it's um, probably not justified. So could Chinese buyers face a stamp duty? Uh, well, it depends on the situation today vis-a-vis um, -vis into the future. Um, I'm pretty sure today they could. Uh, whether they can in the future will depend I think, on a number of factors. And will the TPP rule out a ban altogether? Um, as I understand it, um, the, in terms of China, or do you mean in other places, other, uh, market, other, places other countries? China, um, so in the case of, of China, because Labour wrote in the Most Favoured Nation Status Clause, um, the effect of signing the Korean FTA is in the practical sense it stops a ban of Chinese buy, uh, of Chinese buyers. So it stops the ban on, 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 on a Chinese buyer by virtue of the Korean FTA and the fact that Labour put the MFN status into the China FTA. But technically, if the Korean FTA wasn't there, then yes, it's also possible that TPP would trigger that. But the fact that the first cab off the rank, if you like, is Korea. Would you fix the Korean deal, or is that what you want? No, we don't. As I said, the weekend, you know, you know, we do not support a ban on foreign buyers. We think that it's neither justified uh, nor likely to be terribly effective. Um, there's bans in other countries, and, you know, for the most part, countries don't have bans, uh, but where this happened, we don't think that worked very well. There's lots of ways around them. If you really wanted to stop um, non tax residents from owning property in New Zealand, a far more effective way would be an ongoing tax, far more likely to be prohibited than uh, actually a ban, which they just simply get around. So, would you prefer a land tax rather than a stamp duty? Uh, well, uh, Probably at the moment we're not considering either. We're just saying that it's always important that a government keeps tools in the toolbox for that. I suspect when the data comes out, it'll support the view that the bulk of the buying is actually happening um, for the most part, not by, uh, if you want to take a specific case, China, not by Chinese people with no connection to New Zealand or without you know, residency or citizenship. I think it's, uh, I, I think it's happening with, those, with residents and citizens, should I say, it's not happening no connection to New Zealand. Now I don't know, we need to check that nearer the time, but that's what I, you know, when we have better information, but I suspect actually that's, that's the case. So in which case it wouldn't have any difference because of course they wouldn't be included in any kind of other provisions. So what sort of time frame are you looking at for this um, gathering information and then doing any policy work on what sort of response you need to do? Well there's a logical order here, isn't there? I mean the first thing is set the rules on the, around the information that will be collected. We'll start collecting it from 1 October um, determine under what basis uh, and how we're going to report that data, and then once we do that, I think a public debate will ensue. So before the election, before the election, before the I w would have thought. Well, we're going to try and produce that information as timely as we can, so that'll be said well and true before the election. So it could potentially be early next year. Yeah, I don't have any advice on that yet. You'll appreciate that working their way through that, but. You know, once they start gathering the information, then I can't see why the information should be brought into the public domain. So would it be something that could apply under the holding tax regime that you create? The holding tax is a different issue. Um, so we, we, as I say at this point, haven't seen any evidence to support you know, a land tax or a stamp duty, um, but we strongly have the view there should be a withholding tax. So the difference, of course, is that the way um, tax works at the moment is if you uh, are on revenue account or you trigger the effectively trigger the intent rules um, and therefore you're liable for tax. Um, if you're a New Zealand resident or citizen, obviously we have m much greater way of engaging and interacting with you. Um, what the withholding tax does is effectively says we're going to say as a, as a starting premise that you owe the tax and the burden of proof moves from the IRD saying um, uh, you know, maybe you owe the tax and, and, and you have to pay us to, we're withholding the tax and you have to prove to us that we have to give it back to you. So that's why we like the withholding tax because what we found in the past, or certainly the advice that the IRD's given us, is that there are people who have bought properties in New Zealand probably would have been subject to tax, but they disappear into the ether and we find it very hard to collect that tax from them. So what advice did you have about how many people were doing that? I, I don't. I haven't seen any advice specifically. Todd McClay's office might be able to, you know, give you some better information on that. But you could use the withholding tax to collect, say, a land tax. You could 
could use that, that mechanism. Uh, well, again, we haven't considered that, so I don't know. Well, well all, we, all we have done is, I think rightfully so, identified that it's always important that the government of the day has some tools available to it. I just personally don't think the ban is the right one, because the ban is a very blunt instrument. I mean, as I said, I think, in the weekend, I mean, would you want to ban, for instance, an Australian um, buying a property in Queenstown? Would you necessarily want to ban a foreigner buying a property in Wellington where house prices haven't been going up very much? So your bans are very inefficient things, I mean, and whereas taxes you know, are um, easier to apply and actually a bit more coherent. What about sensitive land? Um, Farmlands. If we sign the TPP, will it make it easier, or, you know, for, for say an American to come buy a big chunk of the wire river? Uh, look, I they haven't completed the negotiations of that yet, and so I, you know, we have been reluctant to get. But will they still have to go through the overseas investment office? Or yeah, will, will, I, that, will that be taken out of the equation? Um, I prefer to give you an absolute definitive answer later, but. Um, on balance is the way I understand at the moment, recognising things can always change, um, they will be subject to you know, the sensitive land provisions and you know, the question for instance with things like the Overseas Investment Act and whether that's triggered is all to do with the threshold and as you've seen for instance with the Australian FTA we substantially increased that threshold um, and they increased it with us and so for when you sell investing in Australia for instance, you know, in many instances they don't trigger the threshold anymore. So the question is not so much about sensitive land, I think, from memory. Um, I'm pretty sure it's about whether it triggers the threshold and how much that increases. Well, it's $10 million or something. Really. It's all work in progress at the moment, but yeah. Labor says the TPP would be trading away our sovereignty. Sorry, who said that? Labor. Yeah. yeah um, they can't do it for and buy well, a slightly crazy thing in, in, in sort of this schizophrenic position that Labor now have is if they felt so strongly about that, why on earth did they write the MFN provisions into the 2008 um, China FTA? I mean, see, the point is that up until they had massive divisions within their own caucus, they were totally supportive of um, basically TPP, from what I could see, and actually um, they weren't trying to apply a ban to foreigners. I mean, house prices double under Labor in the nine years Helen Clark was Prime Minister, and they didn't for one moment think about banning foreigners from buying, and they wrote under exactly those conditions after house prices had doubled, a most favoured nation status clause which gave China the benefit of any other mm. provisions that other governments had. So their positions changed, and their positions hasn't changed because they don't want to do a free trade agreement with the United States. I mean, I, you know, are you really telling me, Phil Goff, who seems to have dedicated his career uh, to trade and to opening up uh, trade along with you know, Clayton Cosgrove and a lot of others really believe it's in New Zealand's interest not to sign a free trade agreement with the biggest economy in the world and the fourth biggest economy in the world. It's just barking madness. I mean, if, if, if they don't support New Zealanders to do, to basically compete and succeed in these big economies of the world when you take away all of the, the, the um, things that hamper that and, and, and let them fight with both hands in front of them rather than one type on their back, then they don't support New Zealand. And actually they do, it's just that Andrew Little's desperate to try and find a way uh, to keep the left flank of his caucus in check. And the problem you've got is, you've now got the Labour Party aligning itself with the Greens, Jane Kelsey and New Zealand First. Well, they're welcome to be there, but that's not the history of the Labour Party, and that's actually not been a successful strategy for New Zealand. I mean, the China FTA, uh, on the advice of Gross, the last game there, was 11 times more successful than the most optimistic economic modelling that we showed. So they're now telling us that that wasn't a good idea. But won't, it depend, won't it depend on the deal on TPP? Because I think there's a study just out of Australia saying that the Australian free trade agreement 